The symbol for the Higgs boson is sadly the most boring thing in the world. It's a lowercase letter H. <laughs> it is, it depends, you know, different, it, there's no agreed upon symbol. I think that lowercase h is the most common, but uppercase h is used, uppercase phi or lowercase phi or various other things are sometimes used. The Higgs boson is a tiny little vibration in a field called the Higgs field, just as the photon, the particle of light, is a tiny vibration in the electromagnetic field, for example. The Higgs boson is not important. The Higgs boson is a little bit of a red herring. What matters, what is crucial for the operation of physics, is the Higgs field that pervades all of space. And the reason why we spent so much effort looking for the Higgs boson is because it's evidence that there is something called the Higgs field. It's a vibration in this field that we've been looking for for over 40 years now. Is the Higgs boson the only way to find the Higgs field? Well, it's the direct way. So when Steven Weinberg and Salam put together what we call the electroweak theory, when they unified uh, electromagnetism with a weak nuclear force, they assumed that the universe was full of this thing called the Higgs field, and that played a crucial role in making sense of, of the rest of the physics that followed. And that theory made predictions, and it fit a lot of data, and the predictions came true. Nobel Prizes were given to Glashow, Weinberg, Salam, to a Tuft and Beltman for figuring out the mathematical underpinnings of the theory, for the experimenters, Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer, for finding the W and Z bosons that were predicted. But it was relying on this ingredient, the Higgs field, that had never been directly detected. The LHC is an amazing, amazing piece of equipment. I mean, I wrote this book about the search for the Higgs, and I came to it as a theoretical cosmologist. I was already very, very impressed with the experimenters before I started writing the book, but I'm much more impressed now, having done it. Uh, the largest machine ever built, thousands of people working on it, 27 kilometers around, thousands of superconducting magnets colder than interstellar space, a vacuum inside the beam pipe that is emptier than the atmosphere of the moon, and they're colliding uh, particles together, protons together, at incredibly high energies and just watching what comes out. And the, amazing, the single most amazing fact to me about the LHC is that when you collide protons together, we have such a wonderful understanding of particle physics that almost everything that comes out is exactly what you would expect. So what they do is they just overproduce data. You know, they have 100 million collisions per second, very, very roughly. The problem with that is that every collision is a megabyte of data, and there's no possible way you can store all that information. So for every million events that they produce, they store one of them to tape. They very quickly look at the event, say, is this possibly interesting? Oh, no, they throw it away, or yes, and they will keep it. So this idea of filtering and throwing away almost all the data turns out to be necessary because what you're looking for is, you know, the one in a hundred billion event. Uh, you can't do it just by creating less data and keeping it all, right? You really need to go through this elaborate process. And miraculously, you know, there was one thing we thought that was absolutely going to be found at the LHC, and we found it, and that's the Higgs boson. We're still looking for things beyond that, of course. But what is it about what the Large Hadron Collider does that produces that one in a billion event? Well, if you believe, as I do, that we should think about particle physics in terms of fields, what's really happening is that the inner workings of the protons are quarks and gluons, so there's vibrating quark fields and vibrating gluon fields, and they smack together and create a very elaborate high amplitude vibration. So it's much like if you're playing the piano very loudly in one room and there's another piano sitting in the room next to you, it will begin to hum along in resonance with your sound waves. So these gluons and quarks start vibrating and they start the other fields of particle physics to vibrating because all the fields are coupled to each other in very subtle ways. So gluons start vibrating and then top quarks start vibrating and ultimately a Higgs vibration is brought into existence. And it decays almost instantly in about one zeptosecond. So you will never see the Higgs boson in any experiment ever done. It instantly turns into other things. And then the hard work begins because you need to pick out the Higgs events, the, the collisions where a Higgs boson was produced by looking at all of the different events you got and say, well, there's more of this type of event than we would have expected. So you do a little bit of detective work and say the only way that could be true is if there's a Higgs. When these huge collisions happen with all this energy and all these fields start wiggling, why is the Higgs field so reluctant to join the party? 
There's, there's two reasons. Uh, the most simple reason is that it's heavy. A heavy field is one that has a lot of mass, and as we all know, E equals mc squared. So energy of a particle just sitting there is the mass times the speed of light squared. So creating a particle with a lot of mass means you need to take a lot of energy and put it into a very, very small region of space. That's why you need this elaborate $9 billion particle accelerator just to make a few tiny Higgs boson. And the other thing besides the energy that it takes is how it couples, how it interacts with other fields. The top quark, for example, is a little bit heavier than the Higgs boson, but it's a little bit easier to make because it interacts more directly with other fields that we know about. So in particle physics, you just can characterize everything you're looking for by how heavy it is and how it interacts, how you can make it. And the Higgs was right there where the LHC could finally find it. Higgs bosons do form very, very, very rarely, but it does happen because you have to remember everything that the Large Hadron Collider does, the universe does all the time and better. There are cosmic rays that are impacting the Earth's atmosphere with much higher energies than we can produce at the LHC but they're up high in the Earth's atmosphere, and then the Higgs boson decays one zeptosecond later, so it's kind of impractical to search for new exotic particles that way. But definitely, yeah, Higgs fields are vibrating throughout the universe. There is the, the non-vibrating field, you know, the background, and that is crucially important to all of particle physics. Electrons and quarks and so forth move through this Higgs-like molasses, or I should say molasses-like Higgs, and that's how they get mass. That's what makes the universe interesting. You know, there's only a small number of fundamental ingredients of reality. I mean, in fact, you could bring it down, you could boil it down to four if you wanted to. There's gravity, there are the other forces of nature, all of which sort of have the same kind of basic structure. There is the matter particles that make up your atoms, you know, the, the up and down quarks in your protons and neutrons, the electrons in your atoms. And then there's the Higgs, right? So it's one of a very, very tiny number of fundamental ingredients you need to explain the world around you. How much is it worth finding that and, and verifying that it's there? The only accurate answer is that it's priceless, right? You know, it depends on how much money you have to spend on basic research, because you're not trying to cure cancer with this. You're not trying to fly to Mars or anything like that. Uh, we're not going to get jetpacks. It's not going to make a better iPhone. But it helps us understand how the world works. I mean, it's a feature of doing this kind of research that you always do get technological spin-offs. The World Wide Web was a spin-off of research at CERN. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we want to understand things. And fortunately, we still have enough money to do it. I guess, I mean, I'm not asking for a jetpack or even a cure to cancer. But has this unlocked a new level? Has this unlocked, for, if for you guys, has it unlocked a new level, or is it just, is it the, is it the, you were right, well done, pat on the back? No, we're certainly very hopeful that it is not only a capstone achievement, but a window onto a whole new world. One of the nice things about the Higgs boson is that it's a little bit more sociable than other kinds of particles, and we know there are particles we haven't yet detected. We know there's dark matter in the universe. If it weren't for dark matter and dark energy, we might really be worried that the particles we already knew about were all that were accessible to us. But we know that's not true. The, most of the, of the mass in our galaxy is not made of the particles that we've created here on Earth. So we're hopeful that by studying the Higgs boson, this gives us a new way of looking for other particles. The ways that the Higgs boson is produced, the way it decays, the way it, use, it, it becomes a, a force mediating interactions between dark matter particles and other particles. These are all new toys for particle physics to study and play with. This is going to be going on for 20, 30, 40 years into the future. These are some incredibly talented, hardworking, dedicated, bright human beings the theorists, the technicians, and the experimenters who built the theories and built the Large Hadron Collider. And they've devoted their lives, literally, to looking for a particle that may or may not be there. And that when you find it, it's not going to make you any richer. It's just going to make you a little bit happier that you found it. Uh, so I wanted to get across why this was so crucial. I mean, why physicists in the United States were crushed with disappointment when Congress in 1993 canceled the United States' competitor to the Large Hadron Collider, the Superconducting Super Collider. Why physicists are still a little bit on tenterhooks about will there ever be another particle accelerator the scale of the LHC. Um, you know, they devote their lives to it. The theorists might spend their entire life working on a theory that the accelerator then says isn't true. 
And, you know, you have to learn to deal with that. But you then get these pictures of Peter Higgs and, and, and um, Francois Anglaire and other physicists who came up with the idea of the Higgs boson back in 1964. And they got to be in the room in 2012 when the experimenters told them, you were right, that is part of nature. And that is a kind of sweet, triumphant success that we can rarely experience as human beings. For me, it's really an incredible thing that has happened in my lifetime. As a cosmologist who's alive at this time, you're very fortunate. You got to enjoy this announcement. You won't live forever, I'm sure. Does it frustrate you that those next things, those things that are 40, 50, 60 years away, just beyond your lifetime, you'll never get to see? Do you ever think about that? Well, I think that the great thing about science is that we almost are always focused on what we don't yet understand. And sometimes the new understandings come fast and furious. Uh, you know, there are times like the 1920s when quantum mechanics was being put together when it's hard to imagine what it must have been like. Uh, when I wrote my book about the arrow of time, I delved into the work in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics in the 1870s. And the debates there are just fascinating to read because they didn't know it was really fundamental stuff and they were building it from scratch and some people didn't believe in atoms at all, right? And other people were using atoms to explain everything. And now in particle physics, we put the capstone on the standard model and we're hoping to find dark matter. In cosmology, we found dark matter and dark energy. Uh, I can't say over the next 10 years, 50 years, are we going to be strewn with new, shocking experimental results or are we just going to be, you know, fine-tuning the understanding we already have? I think the fact that we don't know which of those is going to happen is part of what actually makes it interesting. But I think about someone like Albert Einstein or Niels Bohr, and I kind of think, oh, gee, I wish I could just tell those guys what we found out a few weeks ago. They would have been so happy to know about it. <laughs> and it would be the same for you when you were going, like, oh, I Absolutely. wish I could have told Sean about this thing. He would have loved to know that. Does that, does that eat away? It does, it does not, actually, because you could say that about anybody, right? You could say, you know, what would Einstein have told Newton? But, you know, Newton had his own fun, right? He got to invent physics, basically, right? I mean, Newton could have told Galileo things, but Galileo did his own, his own thing. I think that every generation gets to apply the talents it has to the problems that it's faced with. And right now in science, not just particle physics and cosmology, but overall, there's so many great problems and so much interesting data coming in that uh, we are at no loss for interesting questions to puzzle over. The change of the evolution of the universe. We only need one. We only need the Schrodinger equation. It, in the Copenhagen interpretation, the, the, the thing that we teach our students, the thing that's in the textbooks, 